Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, and welcome to our YouTube channel. Uh, let me tell you that this is a, um, a new thread that we will be starting with you today uh, with this video. Um, we will be working with you on um, tips and tricks to start adapting your work to a virtual classroom. This work is offered by Ain Shams University, Middle East, North Africa, Fama Regional Institute. The website, you can see the website below here. So do um, try to enter our website, see all the new things that we have in store for you and our contribution to this changing world. Today we start our thread with um, a little bit of work on how to do think pair share in your classroom. Think pair share is something that we have been trying to introduce into our face-to-face -face classroom and we will see today how it's not that hard to adapt it to our virtual classroom as well. In order to start talking about that, let's first remember what think pair share is. You all know that think pair share is a cooperative type of learning. It's um, it consists of a question that you give out to the whole group, no matter how big your group is. Make sure that this question is considered individually for a few minutes, maybe thirty seconds to one minute. It will do, depending on your question, of course. And then you pair students together. They discuss with each other, come together with a consensus to a consensus. And then finally, they share their thoughts with the whole uh, class. So this is kind of a collaborative type of learning. And it depends mainly on an in the interaction, the student-to-student -student interaction. So how are we going to do this? Before we know how we are going to do it in the virtual setting, let's ask ourselves first, why are we doing it? We're doing it for three very important reasons. And I want you all to remember that think pair share introduced into a classroom it helps the student learn individually first by giving them what, what we call wait time so we tell them that you have 30 seconds to one minute to think of this issue on your own individually and this gives them time to reflect on their previous knowledge on the correlations between information that they have taken uh, from the beginning of the class on whatever so it actually substantializes the learning that happens and works on a deeper understanding of the concept. So at the end of the day, it improves the quality of the discussion that comes after that. The second thing and that's very important is the low risk opportunity to formulate a response. So numbers one, students are given an opportunity to rehearse with one of their fellows first to do the deliberation to speak to each other, to reach a consensus. So it gives them more confidence to become active in the general classroom when interactions are requested. The third thing, and that's very important by the way, is that, yeah, it potentially exposes students to other uh, points of view of other students and they start to realize if there is a misconception that they have or if there is a possibility for other ideas, they are exposed to it. All this, by the way, it takes like two to three minutes all in all. So in two to three minutes, you reach that level of understanding in the student. You make sure that the student starts to participate and that they have the guts to participate. And they also get exposed to other concepts that exist in the classroom. See how brilliant this is? It's brilliant. But does it always work? Well, you have to make sure that it works by monitoring, you monitor what's going on. You monitor, are all students participating, yes or no? So you want them all to participate. You want different students to start participating and start um, uh, working with you in the share phase. You want students to contribute, but in quality, so they start offering um, uh, products. You may want to make sure that these products are actually um, of good quality and that the quality is improving time by time. You need to monitor your question to make sure that your question is actually a prompting question. It's a question that helps students think and reflect and discuss. So it can't be a simple yes or no question, for example. So make sure that whatever question you pose, this question, it actually prompts thinking, prompts also 
discussion. So this is your opinion. What about the students? You have to make sure that the students are actually benefiting from this activity by post activity questionnaire or maybe by the oral feedback that you take. But it's so important to make sure that students are benefiting, not just taking this time as time out or feeling that this time is a waste of their time. So feedback is important. So how do we set this up? Is it easy? Well, it's easy because it's three phases. Each of these three phases has a special setup. We want the students, number one, to think, and here it is, and then to pair, and then to share. So we want them to do the three things, think, pair, and share. When we want them to think, the setup is about giving them time, which is about 30 seconds to one minute, depending on how big and how deep and how complicated the issue and the question is. They can do this during the class and they can do this in advance, by the way. So you can send the question out before your lecture starts altogether. Yeah, we need to adapt. Nothing is done by the book. You have to do things in order to reach your objective, not to make them exactly as they are written in references. That's not the point. The whole point is for your students to learn. So when they think, they can either scribble, write by pen and paper, write on their laptop, whatever they want to do, they do. But at the end of the day, they need to have this time for themselves to think. What about the pairing? Well, pairing is what we do in the classroom. We tell them just turn to your neighbor or walk across the room to the other side of the room and speak to your colleague, come to a consensus, discuss the... the, the um, uh, the results and come with each other to a consensus but make sure you know why you have reached this consensus the pairing part is is a, it's a little bit difficult when it comes to the virtual setting but we will see now how to do it but then at the end the people need to share so these groups of two they need to share to the whole classroom what the consensus is and how they reached it so either they do this by speaking up or by writing papers or by doing that on a polling software as we will see in a minute or on whiteboard or in the discussion part of the blackboard whatever they do so this is in general how it is set up <clears throat> but now we're going digital and you're with your students on the zoom classroom you have your zoom your webex your poll your um uh, webinar applications, whatever the applications are that you are will be using in real time. So you're in the classroom with your students, but you're all virtually connected. For this presentation that we're doing today, we're using Zoom. So I'm taking Zoom as an example. So you're meeting on Zoom and you have given the students the prompting question. You can either say it orally like I'm doing now or send it in writing on the chat function, whatever you do. But the most important part is that you have your pairs prepared in advance. So you have like a table with the pairs. You say Muhammad is with Mona or Mona is with Ali, whatever. But you create the pairs in advance and you send them to students before your class starts. Or you send them to students in the chat function so people know, know who their pairs are. You ask students to then start discussing in the chat function of the Zoom. Start discussing in private. So, for example, Mona, you are pairing with Muhammad, so please send messages in private on the Zoom chat function. Some students will find it easier for them to start working in the, um, on their WhatsApp. They all have their phones in their hand anyway, so why not start, worth, start WhatsApping our, uh, your pair? So they come to a discussion, which will happen on the chat function. Kids today, they chat really quickly. So that should not be a problem. But then the problem comes when they have to report out, when they have to share. How do you get these students to share? It's simple. If we have a large classroom, sorry, if we have a small classroom, it's usually easier because what we do is open the mics on the Zoom and ask pair by pair to report out and tell us what the consensus was and how they reached it done but what when we have a large classroom which is the situation and the challenge that we face even in the face-to-face -face setting 
Not a problem, by the way, because we can always use poll functions. We have many applications that we use for polls. We use poll to go, polls go, lots of other applications. You can use survey monkeys, whatever you decide to use. At the end of the day, all you have is a link that you send out to students. Tell students, now you have the link, please go in, answer the poll, and you'll get the results in real time. We will be creating other videos on how to use polls to go and polls go in your classroom and how to generate your poll and create it. But now you know that in advance, before you set up your classroom, you need to have that poll ready. And all you have in your hand is that link. So this is something else that you need to do in advance before you actually meet with your students in the Zoom classroom. I hope this was helpful to you and hopefully we will be able to uh, create more videos that give you more insight on how to use the applications in generating interactivity in your classroom in this thread. Please visit our website. The website written on the screen is the website for our fellowship, our, the American Fellowship Program. So please be sure to check out our Famer Fellowship website and to ask questions underneath this video and to subscribe to our uh, YouTube channel. Thank you so much for being with us today and wait for videos to come.